have been four goalkeepers to have won this award. Bert Troutman, Gordon Banks, Pat Jennings and Neville Southall. Where does Pat rank for you in the goalkeepers you've seen play? Of the goalkeepers I've seen play, um, Pat Jennings is the best I've ever seen. Um, I think the year he won this, mid-70s, he was probably the best goalkeeper in the world. Gordon Banks had really held that crown for a while, certainly from England's World Cup win onwards, 66 through to the early 70s. But he, you know, he'd had that unfortunate car crash and, and really lost an eye and, and obviously didn't, well, lost the sight of an eye. Um, Pat Jennings took over, I think, in that period, in the, in the early, sorry, certainly the mid-70s through to the early 80s. Um, absolutely one of the best in the world, if not the best. Um, there were a lot of shouts for Lev Yashin at the time. I, I didn't see Yashin play. And we didn't even see much, you know, European international football on TV at the time. So Jennings was, you know, we went by what we saw in, in the English Championship, as it was called. Um, Jennings was un unbelievable. I, you know, a couple of things spring to mind. I mean, I was, a, I was a young Spurs fan, so I used to watch games mostly on TV and then going to White Hart Lane for home games. But the ones that spring to mind, there was a, there was a, boxing, um, a, a match at Anfield. Liverpool were all absolutely just reaching that, that all-dominant sort of um, era. They were just getting into, that, into their stride. And at Anfield, they were almost impossible to beat, especially, you know, they, they get penalties at the cop end, as you can imagine. It used to happen quite a lot there. Um, and Spurs played, and it was, a, it was a rare lunchtime kickoff because the Grand National, I think, was being held that day at Aintree. So they kicked off at lunchtime and I'd been out to work in the morning, came in in the afternoon. I was, I was you know, still at school, but I was doing some work. And uh, the radio was on and Jennings was just saving his second penalty of the match. One from Keegan and I think one from Tommy Smith. Both, you know, renowned, um, very successful penalty takers. He'd saved two in front of the cop, you know. And I mean, Liverpool fans will, will, of, that, of a certain era will still talk about the day Jennings saved two penalties in front of the cop. It's just not really done. Um, so that was one memorable thing. The other thing about Jennings I think people remember was his, um, his ability to come out. He had such huge hands, come out and clutch, take crosses out of the air with one hand, which is still, and sort of bring them under his arm as he was flying through the air. He, he just had something that was un unbelievable about him. And again, in an era um, when Spurs had sort of some success, but they weren't towards the end of his time there, you know, they were struggling. Um, he, he just, you know, week after week, he was, he was, he was an outstanding keeper. And um, I, don't, I don't know if you've read the, uh, the book The Glory Game by Hunter Davis, where, you know, he, he spent a year following Tottenham in the dressing room. It was, it was incredible access for, for an author. And he talks about, um, they, they faced Leeds, who at Leeds were, the, were, I think, had been champions the season before in the FA Cup. And Leeds, Don Revies used to, used to insist on these really... Um, dossier style scouting reports and they had every weakness every strength every little thing that they could see about the character and the game of any player they were playing against and Hunter Davis talks to the guy who'd done the, uh, the dossier on Tottenham and, and he said I've gone through them 1 to 11 you know and, and this, probably the substitutes I can see you know we know their flaws we know the weaknesses he said but Jennings can't see a weakness, cannot see anything wrong with him, you know. So he was in, in, in the eyes of a very cynical opposition scout uh, for the best team in the, probably the best team in the country. He was, um, he was perfect, you know. So, and again, an unbelievably um, humble, helpful, friendly guy. He didn't do a lot of media, even, you know, even when he was back at Spurs in his sort of role as a goalkeeping coach. Um, in his later years, when I started covering Tottenham and he was around, he used to do the occasional interview, but he was quite sort of reluctant to do too much. And I, you know, I'm lucky enough to know Pat quite well now, and you know, I've done a few interviews with him, but and I played golf with him a few times at the Football Writers Golf Day. Um, but he's not too comfortable doing interviews unless he knows you quite well. So, you know, for me, it's a it's a it's a source of immense pride that he he trusts me enough to do some interviews every now and again. Um, but a terrific guy, fantastic guy. And, and I think you'll go a long way before you find anyone who's got a, a bad word to say about Pat Jennings. But what was it about Pat Jennings that gave him such longevity as well? He, he won the award in 1973, but his career spans you know, such a le large length of time, either side of it. Yeah, I mean, he, well, he, he, he 
kept himself very fit. You know, he, he trained hard. Um, he had one or two injuries, but nothing, you know, in his Tottenham, Tottenham period, I don't think he really had many injuries. So, you know, being number two goalkeeper at Spurs was, uh, you didn't even get on the bench in those days. You know, there was just the one substitute. So, you know, they, Spurs had a, a couple of keepers who, who just sort of were kicking the heels for a long, long time. They were never going to get in beyond Jennings. Um, and I know he, <laughs> there's a great story about it. When he, when he finally played his final game, it was his 40th birthday. And I think it was his 125th cap, and it was against Brazil in the World Cup. You know, I mean, you can't really top that. I mean, obviously winning it would have helped, but... Um, and he'd actually been out of the game for a couple of years just before that. But he saw that uh, Northern Ireland were keen to get him back in the fold. Billy Bingham, the manager, wanted him to play, but he needed him to be playing regular football. So having retired, he sort of came back. He actually went to Everton for a short period. Um, and was, I think he was on the bench in a couple of um, FA Cup games, probably the semi-final, possibly the final. But um, he went back on the Spurs staff and, and played a few reserve games for Tottenham at 39 just to keep his fitness up. And during that qualifier campaign, the Northern Ireland's campaign for the World Cup, he had an outstanding record. I mean, he kept clean sheets against Spain, England, might have been Holland as well. You know, he, he, he played really well. So he was still... A tremendous goalkeeper and he went into that World Cup and, and again you know it, it's no there was no discredit to him for, for Northern Ireland not doing as well as they'd done in 82 but um, yeah played to 40 and you know what a way to go out. So it's, it's been 35 years since the last goalkeeper won this award can you can you see a goalkeeper winning it again? Um, well I can I mean it, it's possible it's you know as we said earlier the team in, in team, um, successful teams, it's often um, a player who catches the eye a bit more with his goals or leadership. So Jordan Henderson this year, um, someone like uh, Jamie Vardy when they won the league, when Leicester won the league, Mo Salah went, uh, with Liverpool two years ago. Um, so, and, and Raheem Sterling last year, you know, again, scored a lot of goals. He finally came good as a goal scorer. Um, I think those sort of attacking players are still going to catch the eye a bit more. Defenders, it's very rare. Midfielders, defensive midfielders, it's, it's pretty rare this, these days. Um, and uh, a goalkeeper, like you say, do they do enough? Um, I mean, if, you, if you've got an opposition goalkeeper saving two penalties at Anfield on a routine basis and, and you know, winning man of the match performances week in, week out, then you'd get a, you know, then there's a chance. But probably not anyone on the horizon that, that's going to capture it, you know. For the second year running, a goalkeeper won the award. After Gordon Banks in 1972, it was Pat Jennings in 1973 who won the Footballer of the Year. And Jennings is regularly talked of in the same breath as Banks, as one of the greatest goalkeepers to have played in England. Just how good a goalkeeper was Pat? I'm asked this many times as you, as you can imagine, and I always give it to Pat by a fingertip from Gordon. And I love Gordon, one of the all-time greats, obviously. But Pat had more physical presence. I mean, he's a giant of a man. Uh, he's, he's got hands, as, as Bill Shankly said, uh, the man with shovels as hands shouldn't be allowed to play football. And that, he said that after Pat had saved two penalties at uh, Anfield in uh, 1973. And uh, <laughs> Bill couldn't believe a goalkeeper could stop a penalty twice at Anfield. Wonderful stuff. But, but Patrick, um, number one, was um, a, a master goalkeeper, master of positioning. He always knew where his goalposts were, never flustered. Um, he could be quite aggressive and physical but back in the days when goalkeepers didn't have the protection they have today. So he could stand up for himself. But most of all, he had incredible reflexes and he would make saves that no other goalkeeper could make. Uh, I would say that Pat Jennings was arguably the greatest of all time uh, alongside uh, Lev Yashin, the great man in black of Russia, and uh, who uh, if everybody who knows anything about football always puts it as their number one. But uh, but Pat, Pat was very close to him. So Pat played over a thousand matches across three decades as a player. What, what was it about Pat that gave him his longevity? He had a very calm 
calm manner. Um, for an Irishman, not very talkative. Uh, he was uh, kept himself to himself. Was always had um, tunnel vision when he when he's playing a match, and uh, he he could cut out everything that was going around him. And all, all he was interested in, where is the ball? He's not going to get past me. And uh, he was he was mesmerising to watch. He, he, I mean, it was almost so sometimes though the ball was drawn to him, and those great big hands of his would collect it. And uh, the number of times I saw him make one-handed catches, which is very rare for any, for any goalkeeper. He would catch the ball with one hand and then throw it out to, to, to the wing to one of his players. He's a master of distribution as well, as well as the saving. What was it about Pat that made him so popular with both Tottenham and Arsenal fans? There have been other players who have played for both teams, but they're certainly not held in the same esteem by both clubs as Pat is. Yeah. Only Patrick could have got away with it. Um, another gentleman called Sol Campbell tried it, and he's hated to this day. But they accepted it with Pat because um, he had good reason to go. Um, he was, had recently moved to a beautiful house in the North London area. He wanted to stay there, and the Tottenham directors of the, at the time, this is before Enoch, of course, they were blind to the fact that they should look after their players and all he wanted was a loan to help him buy this beautiful house. They wouldn't give him the loan. So when Terry Newell, who was their manager at Arsenal, went back for his old teammate, Pat was easily talked into going to, because, simply because the directors were too narrow-minded to realise that they should have helped him buy his house.